In power electronics, we use a lot of current. Unfortunately, a lot of power is also dissipated as heat. Depending on how much power you are using, you may find that your system is producing too much heat and causing the destruction of your ICs. Linear regulators are especially vulnerable to overheating because they dissipate a very large amount of heat while in use. But how can we combat the heat and allow our ICs to continue functioning even when they are producing the heat themselves? Well, we can use a heat sink. Heat sinks basically increase the area in which the dissipated heat can go and it will decrease the overall temperature, saving our circuit. So, in this video, I will explain the best way to determine which heat sink your project needs. Firstly, let's look at an example IC that will generate the heat we need to demonstrate the ability of a heat sink. I'll be using the LM317 linear regulator because it makes it easier for us to understand the power losses that will be in effect. The best place to start is to find the maximum temperature in the datasheet. As we can see, the datasheet recommends that we stay within the 0 to 125 degrees Celsius range for this device. Now that we know the maximum temperature, we need to know how much the temperature will increase given a power loss. In this example, I will be giving the LM317 a 12 volt input and have it output 5 volts at 1 amp. Remember, the equation for power is voltage multiplied by current, so we can expect a power loss of 7 watts. But how do we know how much heat that will generate? Well, that brings us into the concept of thermal resistance. You can think of it as sort of like electrical resistance, in that with a higher resistance, less heat will be able to flow. So in other words, a higher thermal resistance leads to a higher temperature. Ideally, we would like to have as low of a thermal resistance as possible to keep our circuits cool, but that isn't always possible. So how do we find said thermal resistances, and how can we use them in our resulting temperature? Well, we can find all of our information in the device datasheet, thankfully. We can already see that the datasheet has a large table with different thermal metrics, and there are several different columns for each option. That brings us to the package your IC is using. The LM317 I'm using is a 20220 package. However, we can see the other packages around the table. The important metric that we are looking for is the junction to ambient thermal resistance. This basically is the resistance from the inside of the IC to the exposed area in the air. The LM317 has a 37.9 degrees Celsius per watt thermal resistance. Now that we know these important values, we can take a look at an important equation that will allow us to calculate the expected heat. Going back to the example earlier, we already know that our expected power loss is 7 watts. We can use this equation. Junction temperature equals the power multiplied by the junction to case resistance plus the case to surface resistance plus the surface to air resistance. And finally, plus the ambient temperature. For here, our bare LM317, we can replace all of these resistances with the 37.9 degrees Celsius per watt that we got from the datasheet, because the datasheet already made all of these calculations for us. Now, plugging in all the values, with the ambient temperature being estimated at about 25 degrees Celsius, we calculate that it will get a junction temperature of about 290 degrees. So we clearly need a heat sink for this application because 290 is a lot larger than 125 degrees. If we change the load, however, to only one watt of loss, we could get resulting temperatures of 63 degrees. So if your load is small enough, you can get away without using a heat sink. But let's continue with the first example and select an appropriate heat sink for this load. If we are using a heat sink, we need to select a different value from the datasheet. This time, we are looking for the junction to case thermal resistance. For the TO220 package, we have a value of 4.2 degrees per watt. We just need two more values, the case to surface and the surface to air resistances. The case to surface depends on your setup with the heat sink. It is a bit more difficult to get. Its value has a small range from about 0.5 to 2 degrees per watt. Depending on how the heat sink is mounted, Direct mounting gives us about 1 to 1.3 degrees per watt, whereas mounting with a mica insulator gives a resistance of about 1.6 degrees per watt. These figures, by the way, are specific to the TO220 package. If you are ever unsure or just don't want to run the calculations, you can likely safely pick a case to surface resistance of about 1.6, considering that you are using the proper mounting methods. Finally, we need to find the surface to ambient resistance. This is actually very easy if you have access to the heatsink datasheet. I have a few heatsinks here that range from 24 degrees per watt all the way down to 3 degrees per watt. 
The way we can tell whether heatsink is suitable is to simply run the equation. Repeating that same 7 watt example, we find that the small heatsink will give us a temperature of 233 degrees. While this is a lot better than the 290 degrees on the bare IC, it is still far too much. The large heatsink, on the other hand, gives us a temperature of 86.6 degrees. This is a lot lower than the 125 degree limit, so this heatsink is more than enough. It is also a good idea to aim for a maximum temperature lower than the datasheet recommends. For example, we should aim for 105 degrees maximum even though the datasheet says that we can go up to 125 degrees. This is just good engineering practice to leave room just in case. Another thing to keep in mind is the ambient temperature. Sure, we can say that it is 25 degrees while when we are in open air, but in closed cases it will be higher. And one more note, adding a fan can greatly improve the thermal resistance of a heatsink. So if you don't mind the audible noise generated by a fan, it is a really good option. Now I will show you the proper way to mount an IC onto a heatsink. I will give both a TO220 and a TO3 example. Starting with the TO220 package, we first need the heatsink itself, a screw, an insulating shoulder washer, an isolating pad, and a nut. First, we will put the washer onto the TO220's hole. Then we will fit the screw into that hole. The isolating pad will go through the other side of the screw. And finally, we can locate the hole on the heatsink and screw the whole assembly into place. Make sure that it is tightly fit. No matter the size of your heatsink, this method should work. Anyways, you now know all about heatsinks, from how to pick one, all the way to mounting it onto your IC. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing so that you can see my other videos. Have a good one.